course, these are built on firm mathematical and statistical analyses, background, um, and we can apply those to evaluate our trees and how well they are. Uh, but by and large, what we do is computer simulations. And that's by far what we do nowadays. However, there was a, uh, a brief appeal of experimental phylogenetics back in the early 90s, uh, and this is comparison of inferred trees with actual true known evolutionary histories. And those known trees could either be experimentally generated in the lab or otherwise known, such as with HIV patient-patient transmission sampling. So both of these two approaches have a couple drawbacks. Um, the great thing about simulations is that they make explicit simplifications using proposed models of evolution. And a drawback to simulations is that they make explicit simplifications using proposed models of evolution. Uh, thus, they have a very difficult time handling very complex or even emergent properties of the evolutionary process. Uh, these include things such as natural selection, distribution of mutational effects, uh, complex epistatic interactions, and all of these things changing dynamically over time throughout the evolving process. And then other population level processes too, such as clonal appearance, um, genetic hitchhiking, etc. Uh, Todd Oakley came out with a um, ardent critique of experimental phylogenetics back in 2010, and his two main issues were these. So a couple points related to the feasibility of experimental phylogenetics. It's just very difficult to do. Uh, it's very uh, costly because of this. There's lack of replication. It takes a lot of time on the researcher's part. And even still, you can't really observe that great of an extent of evolutionary change. His other um, main critique was just that there's this trade-off then between the feasibility of experimental phylogenetics and whether it's more biologically realistic or not. Uh, so again, it, it's not necessarily representative of all of nature. You can't generalize an experimental phylogenetic study. Uh, but it does provide information on one actual evolutionary history as opposed to an exhaustive set of conditions that never actually apply in nature. So the landmark study of experimental phylogenetics was done by David Hillis and collaborators back in 1992. And he evolved this, um, this uh, bacteriophage uh, T7 evolutionary history, starting with a single clone ancestor, and then seeding each of these lineages with a clone. Uh, so he created this symmetrical, nine taxon rooted um, tree evolutionary history with periodic cladogenesis, and then evaluated different methodologies to see how they performed. Their results were that with restriction endonuclease data, all methods predicted true tree, the, the true tree in terms of um, uh, clade support, what clades they uh, reconstructed. However, with sequence data, maximum likelihood was only able to infer five to six clades correctly, and I'll touch back on that then when I show you my data. So we were interested in replicating this, but you know, harnessing uh, the abilities of a different system to make it more feasible to, to conduct different experimental uh, phylogenetic analyses. So first, if we're gonna look at a completely different system, all the requirements for phylogenetics need to be met. It's very simple, just inheritability, um, traits with variation, ancestor descendant relationships, cladogenesis, and if we're going to use maximum likelihood, Bayesian inference, modern methods, we need a model of um, evolution. So we propose to do this with digital evolution via the Avita software platform. So what is Avita? It's evolution in a computer. So we have these digital organisms and they are evolving in this digital landscape. So a digital organism is a small computer program and it's composed of a sequence of computational instructions. That's its genome. The genome allows it to be able to self-replicate, and when it does so, um, mutations can be introduced in a probabilistic manner according to the mutation rate. And the genome also can allow it the ability to form different computational tasks. So uh, there's just a schematic of this over here. We're inputting a number from the environment, doing some stuff on it, outputting a number. If those numbers match in some way that we a priori set the environment to reward, then that organism will get a, a boost and be able to replicate quicker. So, we have here heritability, variation, and differential fitness. We have all the ingredients of natural selection at play here, so we have adaptive evolution, and then genetic drift, all other population level processes are all inherent to the system. Uh, Avita sequence data resembles the amino acid sequence data. We just uh, characterize this as single letter abbreviation, 20 different characters. And then of course, it just looks like an amino acid line, alignment thing too, right? You sample organisms from the same population or from multiple different populations. Avita also has a known model of evolution. Its actual mutational model is Poisson, so a mutation from any one instruction to any other is just equally likely to occur. And it also has a knowable substitution model. The great thing about digital evolution and Avita specifically is that we have a perfect digital record of everything that's occurring within the system, including all of the genomes of all organisms, all, all in 
individuals in the population at each generation. Therefore, you can just simply um, you know, reconstitute what all those substitutions were and generate an actual matrix from them. So Avita meets all of these requirements for phylogenetics and um, deals with some of these feasibility issues that are involved with experimental phylogenetics. And thus, I think it's a nice trade-off then between uh, Todd Oakley's critiques of feasibility and biological realism. So our research questions then are, do experimental histories generated with artificial life resolve as we would expect them to under simple conditions? And then can we expand this to, to look at more complex um, situations too? And then ultimately, of course, can these results inform biological reality? We replicated this uh, T7 phage study, um, approximately replicated the substitution rate so we get the comparable branch lengths throughout the tree. Um, and we instituted a perfect alignment. So we didn't allow any insertions or deletion mutations. We didn't want to have to mess around with any alignment issues. And we used a Poisson model of molecular evolution. We did generate empirical models too, but for everything I'm going to show you here, they really didn't have an effect. And we used Mr. Bayes and Rexamil to um, construct and for treats for which we could evaluate. We then extended this to include a number of other factors, such as recombination. And with recombination, we also varied the lineage seeding. So how are each of these lineages seeded throughout the tree as we're going along, experimentally evolving these populations? So either asexual recombination or asexual reproduction, no recombination, and uh, seeding each new lineage with a single clone, the most abundant genotype at the end of the previous lineage, or uh, sexual recombination and cloning the entire population and seeding the lineages in that way. Then we also introduced natural selection in different, different schemes and minimized or maximized the relative extent of genetic drift versus natural selection by changing population size. We also varied the extent of evolution occurring across the tree, just the number of generations per branch, and we either did this in uniform manner uh, across all branches in the tree or varied the number, uh, the number of generations per branch. So we evolved a known evolutionary history. We sampled at the very end and then infer trees using Mr. Bayes and Rexamel. And then of course we need a, a criterion to evaluate how well the accuracy of our inferred trees are to the true tree. And uh, we use the Robinson Foltz distance measure. Uh, we could use a whole bunch of tree distance measures, this is just one of them. And we normalized this by the maximal um, Robinson Foltz distance for this number of taxa. So uh, here it's just 0.17. Then we actually used clade accuracy, which is just one minus that number. Um, and we did this because it not only has a direct interpretable, um, you know, uh, it's directly interpretable, it's percent of clades reconstructed accurately, but um, I also think it's, it's nice in experimental phylogenetics to look at the positive side of everything. You know, how well are we doing? We're doing really well, usually. So clade accuracy then is just 83%. The H and I um, sister clade isn't, isn't reconstituted there in the inferred tree. And so we have 10 replicates for each of our experimental conditions here. And now this is important. I only took a single tree from each of these replicates with either Raxamel or Mr. Bates. Um, so either the single tree with the greatest uh, maximum likelihood value or the single tree with the greatest posterior probability. And now I totally acknowledge that this is a very, um, you know, throwing out a lot of data here. We can look more into this much more uh, in depth about everything, including, you know, the actual uh, model of uh, you know, evolution and everything. Um, but this is just a very nice, um, just broad stroke of the accuracy of these methods. So then we took a mean of that for each experimental condition. These are the type of data I'm going to be showing you, so I'm just going to walk you through this real quick. We're going to have plate accuracy there on, on the y-axis, ranging from 0 to 100%. So actually reconstituting the correct tree, um, all of those clades for all of the, the uh, experimental replicates, all 10 trees. And then across the x-axis, we have the different treatment conditions. And these are going to be broken up into different columns with some data points above there. And generally, the data points will almost always overlap. So if you only see one dot, uh, Raxamel, Mr. Bayes, they're, they're right in there. OK, so simple neutral evolution. It's actually a very, very weak stabilizing selection. Um, both methods do very, very well. Strong stabilizing selection, very strong stabilizing selection. We see that for a limited extent of evolution on the tree, um, we're actually not being able to infer one of the six clades correctly. And if you recall back to that Hillisol study, that's exactly what they found too. So we just don't have that many um, variable informative sites here. So this is a nice, um, you know, we're getting what we predict we would be getting with this. When we added recombination, at least how recombination works right now in Avita, uh, we didn't see any effect. And I'll just remind you that when we have recombination working, we also have population transfers too. So we can have things such as lineage sorting effects and other things to play. 
And then we differ the extent of, uh, of evolution across the tree by varying these different branch lengths. So I abbreviate these different conditions um, using either short or long for S and L. And this is reading backwards in time. So this first tree is SLL, 300 generations, 300 generations, and then 3,000 generations. So a really long internal branches there deep in the tree. And then the number of, of different ones of these. So this is just varying the number of long branches and their placement in the tree. And then a, uh, a final tree there with just equalizing the extent of evolution on all of those branches to all 300 generations. Just breaking up those branches. Here's what that data looks like. Alright, here's what that data looks like. Um, you can see that when we have long external branches and long internal branches, and especially when those long internal branches are deeper in the tree, we're having a harder time inferring the correct tree topology. So this is essentially due to long branch attraction occurring throughout the tree. Um, and this is exemplified by the um, percent of parsimony informative sites. Uh, really high parsimony informative site value, right? But they're almost all homoplasias. And then we uh, varied degrees of adaptive evolution across the tree. And I'm not going to exactly tell you how we did this, or, but I'm gladly answer it in the question session if you want to hear. But we essentially have four different treatments, and it's just increasing directional selection across the tree topology. Before I show you that data, I'll add in a combination to all of these, because I mean it's pretty simplistic. We don't see that these methods are having a hard time inferring the correct tree at all. You've seen all of this data before, but just to remind you, here's lineage evolution, adaptive evolution, and recombination at play. So we had all those as single factors. Now let's combine them into the same um, to experimental treatment. And so then, um, just to remind you, the correlate to LSS for the selection data is just LLL. They're all just long branches. So when we have all of these combining, uh, combinations of factors at play here, we're getting this really unpredicted combinatorial effects. Uh, a lot of stuff is happening on these trees and um, it's really interfering with our ability to infer the correct tree. Um, now we're not entirely sure what is going on in these instances right now, but again, it's beta digital evolution. We have a perfect record of everything that's happening. So um, we can you know, take a detailed look at everything that's happening and track down all these homoplasies and attribute, uh, attribute them to various different effects that are occurring. And then I also want to show you another result um, this is just the Mr. Bayes data, plotted with the mean posterior probability for those 10 trees. And you can just see here that the tree posterior probability is very, very highly indicative of plate accuracy. So if we had a mean posterior probability of 0.95 or greater, um, our mean plate accuracy value is very, very high, uh, generally 100%. And then posterior probability is lower than that. We wouldn't necessarily be sure we were getting the correct tree out of those. And you can't generalize anything from this because this is experimental evolution here, it's not simulation at all, but that's an interesting result, I think. So then our conclusions, uh, Mr. Bayes and Raxamel perform very, very well, even under um, conditions that we think would be otherwise difficult, and that the tree posterior was indicative of plate accuracy for all of our experiments here. Uh, and then we found these really interesting combinatorial effects when we have various complex factors at play here, um, which we can investigate much, much further. And finally, just that digital evolution is a very attractive companion, I think, to simulations and experimental phylogenetics using a biological system. Um, we can investigate much, much more than what I've shown you here. Um, things such as um, you know, introgression and uh, any, anything that would contribute essentially to gene tree, species tree, um, discord, uh, a huge number of factors that we can investigate here. So this is just a very small scratch on the surface. So I want to thank my lab mates and my um, PI, Barry Williams, also David Hillis and April Wright for their valuable feedback, and my resources and funding, especially at Beacon Center. And if you want to learn more about Avita or Beacon, go to those links. And all of these slides are on SlideShare. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm glad to take any questions.